looking ahead to that year through the lens of this one, in which we face a pandemic that challenges past achievements and makes progress more difficult, Delta 8.7 convened a symposium on our website, bringing together contributors from four organizations who are working on implementation and evaluation of programs and measurements to combat child labor in different contexts. I'm really pleased to be turning today's conversation over to our four panelists, who with their colleagues provided contributions to that symposium. They are Claudia Kappa, who is Senior Advisor for Statistics in the Data and Analytics section at UNICEF headquarters, Oscar Castillo, Project Director for World Vision's Campos de Esperanza project, Dan Carlin, Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Officer for Goodweave International, and Insaf Nizam, Specialist on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work for the International Labor Organization. After each has spoken a bit about their work in this context, we will have some time for questions and conversation with the audience. So please use the Q&A function throughout this event to submit questions for this panel, and we'll turn to those at the end. And now, if I could invite Claudia Kappa to speak about her work with UNICEF. Claudia? Thank you very much, uh, Alice, for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about UNICEF work, but more broadly, about data and how the COVID-19 has the possible impact on increasing the prevalence of, uh, of child labor. We have published in July uh, a publication with UNICEF uh, and ILO that try to understand what are the possible impact of COVID-19 on the determinants and ultimately the number and proportion of children who are engaged in child labor. As uh, you mentioned, uh, and rightly so, Alice, recent years have seen a significant progress in the fight against child labor. But the current pandemic can potentially reverse the positive trends that has been observed in several countries and further aggravate the problem in regions where child labor has been more resistant to policy and program measures. And this would mean a rise in child labor for the first time since 2000. But can we actually quantify the expected impact of COVID-19 on the prevalence of child labor? This is a very difficult uh, estimation to make. It is difficult for a number of reasons. And in my intervention, I would like to discuss some of the challenges in coming up with an estimate of the impact of COVID-19 on child labor. ILO and UNICEF are developing a simulation model to estimate such impact on the global prevalence of, of, of child labor. And the model uh, will consider the root causes of child labor and will be released in 2021. But let me start with a quick overview of what we already know about child labor from existing data. According to the latest estimate that were released in 2008, over 150 million of children all over the world are engaged in child labor. Of this 152 million, 73 were in hazardous work. Sub-Saharan Africa has the larger proportion of child labor at about 30%. And of course, there is a significant variation in the prevalence of child labor within Africa, but also across countries from all over the world. Since 2000, the total child labor uh, number has been reduced from 246 to 152 million. And this has been uh, particularly relevant among adolescents, those between the ages of 15 and the ages of 17. In particular, there has been no change in the prevalence of child labor among the youngest children. And the reduction that we have seen in the prevalence of child labor among those aged 15 to 17 is in part attributable to broader labor market conditions and therefore may be very fragile. In many countries, uh, the youth employment crisis made it very difficult for children above the minimum working age to find jobs. So what's behind the reduction in child labor that has been documented up to 2008 was mostly lower demand for adolescent workers 
And this is what's behind this lower level of involvement of children in hazardous work. So as you can see, there has been already progress, but at, this time, at the same time, the progress was based on very fragile uh, basis and affected or was benefiting in a way the children who, um, who were uh, above the minimum, the minimum age. So the pandemic is really can have a tremendous uh, detrimental impact uh, because the, the pandemic has been activating a number of key determinants uh, for child labor. So for instance, uh, there has been, of course, a documented fall in living standards, deteriorating employment opportunities, rise in informality, reduction in remittances and migration, contraction of trade and foreign direct investments, temporary school closures, health shocks, pressure on public budgets, and international aid flow. However, we also know, and this is what makes the estimation work particularly complex, that as we document the many different um, socioeconomic impacts, negative impacts that I just mentioned, there is potential for interventions to mitigate the impact of this disruption. We know from research and previous data that certain specific policies and target intervention can reverse the course, can put a stop to the so, uh, to the uh, to some some of the important determinants and this is what makes of course the estimation of the actual quantitative impact of covid on the prevalent social matter is particularly particularly problematic because these policies are currently being implemented we do not know yet what impacts these policies policies will be and to conclude i just wanted to flag Something with respect to data. Being a data person for me, I mean, I cannot not make my intervention also about strengthening uh, the quality and the availability of data on child labor. Because indeed, there has been progress in this respect. If we go back to the year 2000, at the time, we had internationally comparable data on child labor for only about 40 countries. Now we have more than 120 countries, mostly low and middle income countries for which we have data. However, these data are not always collected at regular interval. And for many countries, they are still outdated. So we are unable really to monitor trends and really estimate the impact of COVID-19 if we don't have baseline data. And the last word is very much about being careful as we try to respond to these very important research questions, as we try to quantify the impact of COVID-19 on child labor, we need to invest in robust data collection. We know that there have been many disruptions to the activity of national statistical offices in the field. Again, due to COVID, many statistical offices have changed mode of administration resorting to phone-based surveys, for instance, or, or, or surveys based on online. But there are a number of methodological complications, ethical considerations to make while conducting data collection in times of crisis. And I really want to, 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 to conclude by saying it is indeed very important that we invest in data, but this cannot be done at the detriment of data quality, and certainly not if ethical protocols cannot be put in place. Thank you very much. And of course, I will be happy to address any question that um, the audience might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, now, if I could turn to Oscar Castillo um, and invite you to take the floor, because um, I know that Campos de Esperanza is doing a lot of work directly on the ground in Mexico. Thank you, Alice, and good morning. It's a pleasure to me to be here and share with you a, a proposal to address um, child labor with a comprehensive approach. This proposal is based on World Vision experience implementing child labor project for more than 17 years. And we have adjusted the, this approach to the Mexican con context and implemented through the Campos de Esperanza project. Can you please um, share the, the presentation? Thank you. 
I will talk a little bit about, about Campo de Esperanza and also to explain the approach briefly, I will share with you some examples of what we are doing in this, in this project. Next, please. Next, Campo de Esperanza is a, if it's a DOL funded project implemented by, the, by World Vision. Our goal is to prevent child labor in two sectors in Mexico, in the sugarcane sector, and also the coffee sector in two states, Oaxaca and Veracruz. Next, please. We're working in, in four municipalities in these states. Uh, these municipalities, um, uh, we can find migrant agricultural workers in the sugarcane sector. Also, we have indigenous populations that they produce and harvest coffee in the Songolica region in Veracruz using uh, mainly family labor. And also one of the main characteristics of, of these communities is that uh, there is a high prevalence of child labor related with these sectors. Next, please. In these uh, four municipalities, we're working in, in 24 communities and we have a um, implementation strategy that includes four different components. So I will go through each component, uh, presenting some of the different activities that we are carrying out. So I will start with the social mobilization and communication component. As you can see, it includes uh, three different um, strategies as awareness raising. We have developed awareness raising activities based on a barrier analysis where we define the communication gaps and also the key messages so we can develop uh, materials, communication channels, uh, and uh, printed materials on child labor and labor rights. We have also included a community murals. Community murals is, has been in a strategy with a great acceptance at the community level because it, it reflects all the community characteristics, including the culture, the landscape, and the main uh, point of reference in the community. Also, we have established radio spot uh, and that are broadcasted through local radios. We are reaching around 100,000 people and in these uh, local radios, radio stations, we, we are broadcasting around eight radio spots. We have a radio soap opera with, uh, right now we are developing, developing 20 chapters uh, that tells the story of a family, a migrant agricultural worker family where the children is talking with their parents about child labor, about the risk in the agricultural sector and the importance of education. With the pandemic, we developed um, COVID-19 prevention materials because we identified that in the communities that we're working, the families, the workers don't, didn't have information at that moment about COVID-19. So we developed these materials and delivered um, in person to workers, families, to target households. Uh, the awareness raising campaign is complemented with community dialogues and community committees. Community dialogues is a world vision methodology to promote um, community development, and it includes uh, the um, meetings where the community leaders can review, can prioritize their problems, and the project is, is uh, focusing on and promoting that the communities talk about the different problems that are affecting children, particularly regarding to child labor. And within these communities, one of the decisions that the communities establish is that they want to take some actions and they want to organize. And, this, and they decided to establish community committees that we have called children well-being committees. The children well-being committees are integrated by community leaders that have been trained by the project on child labor, on child protection, and these committees are going to be providing follow-up to child labor cases. They're going to be working closely with, us, with the schools. And also they are going to be um, referring cases to the child protection systems. Next, please. These are some examples of the activity that we have conducted in the field. Um, next. These pictures are before of the pandemic. With the pandemic, we have to start all the direct implementation of services, and we shift to virtual activities and also other distance activities that the children can carry out with their parents at, at their households. 
The education component um, objective is to improve the access to education to children engaged, engaged or at high risk of child labor. This includes activities within the schools and outside the schools. Uh, within the school, we work closely with parents, with teachers, we provide training to teachers. These trainings um, focus on, on how we can strengthen teacher capacity to identify children that is in child labor or high risk of child labor, and also that teachers are aware about the needs of these children, because if they are not aware about the needs of the children in child labor, they cannot provide an adequate follow-up, they cannot provide uh, the academic, they cannot uh, provide the academic uh, supervision that these children need and support as well. Also, we are uh, providing life skill development training for children in schools. Uh, we use a methodology called RETRO, and we also are implementing our vision methodology called Solidarity Tutors, where children provide uh, peer support to other children. So children from, from grades above, they provide uh, academic support to other children, helping them to, to study, helping them with the homeworks. Uh, we also have activities outside the school. For example, the community libraries. Community libraries uh, had a big impact in the communities where we are working because um, the, the parents, the community leader has said that it's a space where children is safe. It's a space where children can play, can learn, and where, and where children can also improve their reading skills. For youth out of school, we know that it's important to, to develop a specific alternative. And that's why we're coordinating with Vocational Training Institute. These are public training centers to provide uh, these opportunities for, for youths that are out of school and that they are interested in going back to school. So, so we, we combine the life skill training with the vocational training. Next, please. These are some examples of the activities within the schools and activities after school. With the pandemic, as I mentioned, we developed some audiobooks, uh, we developed some materials that have been delivered to our target population uh, with activities that they can develop at their, at their houses. Next, please. The private sector uh, engagement, we are working uh, very closely with the national and local leaders of the sugarcane sector and the coffee sector. And we have developed different uh, guidelines, manuals on child labor, labor rights, on OSH. These manuals have been developed based on a risk assessment, occupational risk assessment, also the risk of, of the, the risk of labor rights violations in the field. And based on this analysis, we have built a consensus with, uh, with the sugarcane sector on how they want to address child labor, how they want to address labor rights. And that way, we, based on that, we, we establish guidelines. And based on the guidelines, we develop materials and training material. Right now, we have trained around, around 4,000 um, private sector stakeholders on child labor and OSH. We also uh, know that in the case of the coffee sector, we need to strengthen the, organi the organizations. In the region that we are working, we have a lot of uh, small holders, producers that are not organized. So if we want to, to prevent child labor, we want to, to reduce labor rights violation, we have to improve the working conditions and the um, livelihood of the families. So in the case of the coffee producers, we are thinking the strengthening of, of the organization is well, it's one way uh, complemented with the access to market. Next, please. These are some examples. Uh, before the pandemic, we conduct all the trainings in the field while the workers are, are in, the, in the harvest. We also have organized vaccination campaign for workers and provided the first aid training. Right now, uh, we're, we're starting the next sugarcane harvest and we are establishing all the prevention measures to conduct some activities in the field. It's not going to be the same <laughs> as we know, but we're going to take all the measures because 
the agricultural activities are going to continue. So we have to be sure that we have uh, we are providing the information about how to prevent uh, COVID-19 infections in the in the field, particularly in the sugarcane sector, where we have in one sugar mill around 2,000 workers. So there is a high risk of inf infections. Uh, and also to continue promoting the labor rights compliance and the prevention of child labor. Next, please. In the uh, public sector, uh, we are coordinating at the federal level, but also at the state level. And our main goal with the public sector is to strengthen first the coordination mechanism. In the case of Mexico, um, we have the city. The city is the Inter Institutional Commission for the Prevention and the Eradication of Child Labor. And within the city, there, the fed, at the federal and the state level, they decide and establish a specific work plans, a specific actions where the different agencies contribute to address child labor issues. So we're working with the city at the federal level and also promoting the establishment of the cities at the state level where we're working in, in Veracruz and Oaxaca. Also, we have developed training uh, with uh, for public servants on child labor, on OSH. Uh, the training on OSH was particularly for labor inspectors. And also, we are coordinating with the different agencies that are related uh, with child labor. So, in one hand, we have the improvement of the interinstitutional coordination. And in the other, we are also promoting that revision and adjustment and implementation of protocols and procedures uh, to prevent child labor. So once uh, the, the uh, children or child is identified in the, um, in the workplace, um, we, we have the, the clarity of who is responsible of the follow-up of this case and what is going to be the procedure to be sure that these children is not going to, to continue working and that uh, uh, he will have uh, the defend of all his his rights so these are this is a very quick presentation of what we are doing and i'm happy to answer any question thank you thank you so much oscar um and we have dan carlin who is working at goodweave on child labor that is typically hidden in supply chains um, Dan, could I ask you to speak a bit about that? Sure. Um, I'll assume that my audio is fine, but if anybody has any issues, just, just let me know. First, thanks to Delta 8.7 for hosting the panel today, and, and thank you to uh, Claudia and Oscar for your presentations on, on the interesting work that you're doing. I will... <clears throat> go over some of the challenges that Goodweave is seeing in maintaining progress against child labor uh, in light of COVID. Before I do that, I think it's always good to take a minute to, to mention who we are and what we do. So I think Goodweave is probably best known by our label, which is on carpet and home textile products. And that label provides assurance that the product was made without the use of child forced or bonded labor. Uh, a, a brand can get that label by partnering with Goodweave and committing to sourcing from supply chains that are free of child labor. So we have 187 brand partners. They're based in 19 countries. Many people know Target or Restoration Hardware. And the supply chains where we work are in India and Nepal. And they cover the carpet, home textile, and apparel sectors. So what we do, uh, our approach to eradicating child labor, it, it has three main pillars, uh, build visibility, stop abuse, and address root causes. And I'll just take a moment on each of those. James, could you please uh, bring up the slide? Thank you. So we know that there really is a gap between where companies can implement their due diligence programs and where exploitation tends to most take place. And in my piece, I, I refer to the, the different level, or I refer to uh, the hidden supply chain as, as the place where the exploitation does happen the most. So as we look at this slide, the, the, the supply chain, the parts of the supply chain that the brands tend to be aware of are, are in blue. So we have 
of course, the customer and stage, we have the store importer, then we have uh, the, the exporter level facilities, which is the last, the, the stage at which the product is finished. But below them in gray, we have these other layers. We, we have uh, subcontractor work sites that are, that are supplying the exporters. Then below those subcontractors, we have home-based work sites. They're supplying the subcontractors, or in rare cases, they may be supplying directly to the exporter. But these are work sites that, that uh, companies do not have visibility into. Uh, if they know, even if they, if they know they exist, they don't know to what extent. We had a brand partner that signed on with us and they gave us five exporter facilities. And when we went and we found, we, we found all of the work sites that were supplying those facilities, there were over 900 outsourced work that the company had no idea existed. Thanks, James, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so the second, that brings us to the second pillar, which is stopping abuse. When we find a case of child labor through our unannounced inspections, we'll remove the child from the, from the work site. And then we have a team in place that follows up and makes sure appropriate remedy is given. And that can include reuniting with family, uh, enrollment in school. And, and we do follow up then to make sure that the child doesn't go back into the supply chain. Addressing root causes, I think that, that could be a long conversation in itself, but in short, we focus at the community level on um, strengthening education systems, changing attitudes about education, and helping children who have fallen behind in their studies to get caught up. Then at the, at the company level, uh, we advocate for supply chain due diligence and, and government level for, for uh, appropriate labor laws. We also have a capacity building element to our work whereby we share uh, the, the methodologies that we've mastered with other organizations and, and then they can practice them going forward. And that's, that's really key for us to be able to multiply our impact in geographies and sectors where we are not able to sustain a, a full-time presence. So in all of that work, there are always challenges and, and COVID certainly has not made those challenges any easier. I think the pandemic has forced everyone to adjust and we've seen challenges from the marketplace level, business and marketplace level, all the way down to the ground. And, and, and many of those challenges do exacerbate the risks for child labor. So I'd like to cover a couple of those. I think at the, the market or the business level, many of our partners, <clears throat> Many of our brand partners are really struggling, of course, and, and if you're struggling to keep your doors open, um, your priorities might shift. And so responsible sourcing might not be at the top of that list. And we've seen important personnel, important staff that are charged with responsible sourcing in, in brands be furloughed during this time. So for good, we've obviously we always want the spotlight to be on that. But in this context, there are, there are challenges with the priorities that, that brands are, are having to um, create. Further down the supply chain, we've seen a major impact on workers. Goodweave did some rapid research uh, in India and Nepal and worker communities. And we found that 60% of the workers that we surveyed had seen their incomes decrease since the beginning of COVID many of whom had lost their jobs entirely. And these are workers, of course, who do not have much in the way of savings. And so that loss of income can quite quickly lead to a desperate situation. And all of us know that that can spike the risk of, of child labor. On our business side, we're generating less funding for our work. We have a model that's sustainable uh, and it, it, it involves the, the brand partners we work with uh, sharing or giving a proportion of their earned revenue uh, to Goodweave. But of course, as their business volume decreases, that will cut into the resources we have to do our important work in the field. That said, it has an impact at all companies the same. Uh, we have actually increased our partnerships over the course of the pandemic, and we've seen some brands that are, that are thriving. So that's a positive sign. Few challenges on the ground. Um, 
the number one for us is is that's good. We've we we have. I described our model earlier, we have to be in the field. We have to have a constant presence in supply chains and in communities to do this work. And right now, it, we aren't going to put our own team or the communities where we work in danger. We've started recently very slowly and carefully uh, scaling back into a field presence, but that presence obviously needs to be quite robust and we're not there uh, at, the, at, at this time. And then another challenge has been related to informal workers. That's our focus. And we've seen that government relief programs, including those for the pandemic, often don't reach them. They, are, they need food, they need money, but one example is the uh, financial relief services in India, which are provided by bank transfer. Well, many informal workers don't have active bank accounts. We've found this and they're not able to access the payments. So part of our emergency relief work is setting them up with bank accounts. And we are expecting to um, provide a, or, or register about a thousand workers for bank accounts by the end of this month. Our emergency work also includes food aid and hygiene aid. These areas are very difficult to reach. And so we are making sure that that, that aid does reach the workers and, and communities uh, in those difficult in those difficult to reach places. So the emergency work such as that, it, it does allow us to keep an eye on the child labor risks and have a sense of what's happening in these communities. And, and that information, we expect that'll be important when we are able to, to fully ramp back up into our regular presence. And we will do that as soon as it's safe to. And we will ensure that that we are following up on that information. So those are some of the challenges. I think I will pause there and look forward to discussing further in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and I'd like to turn now to Insaf Nizam and how the ILO is working with government to close the gaps. Insaf? Thank you very much, Alice, and uh, thanks to all the my, my fellow panelists, you know, very inspiring and uh, interesting uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> my story is going to be about a country in South Asia, which is uh, uh, one of the few countries that have come very close to uh, the total elimination of child labor. Uh, when you have a child labor problem, maybe whatever percent, you reduce it to 5%, then 2%, then 1%, or even less than 1%, uh, you would tend to think that, you know, okay, the rest is easy going, but uh, it doesn't happen uh, that way always. The last leg could be the most uh, challenging because uh, it presents new types of challenges and uh, difficulties in measuring and monitoring. So <clears throat> just to uh, have a glance at how Sri Lanka came to less than 1%, um, of course, there are many factors, but uh, uh, what I would say is there are three uh, big or major ingredients that contributed to the success. One is a strong social welfare policy measures Second one is evidence-based policy responses. And third one is uh, long-term political, technical, and financial commitment. These three uh, key factors in the success, among other factors, I would say. Uh, talking about the first one, uh, social welfare measures, uh, we have to acknowledge that child labor, elimination of child labor doesn't come in a, in a vacuum. It is connected to a lot of other measures, that, uh, policies that the country would adopt. So in this regard, uh, I would say that uh, co uh, consistent uh, uh, policies in terms of improving primary education, primary enrollment, improving education services, offering free education and free health, uh, focus on employment, uh, focus on youth employment, uh, have been key to creating the enabling environment for elimination of child labor in Sri Lanka. And then uh, public awareness, 
because of the high literacy rate or relatively high rate, rate, literacy rate that the country enjoys, like 96%, uh, the public awareness is also high. And because of that, the country has been able to create the right attitudes or the right social norms towards child labor. Secondly, evidence-based policy responses are crucial. And for that, you need to have uh, proper information, proper data, and countries has, have to invest in regular data collection, as the previous uh, panelist, uh, Claudia, also mentioned. This is an investment that will not go waste. Uh, Sri Lanka has been having regular child labor surveys uh, since 19, uh, 1999, and then uh, 2008, 2016, etc. And through these, the, through the proper analysis of this data, it has been able to, the country has been able to come up with good policies. For example, uh, in the 2008 child labor survey, uh, it identified that there were certain pockets that were concentrated, uh, uh, where child labor was concentrated, particularly in the plantation or the estate sector. And with this, the country adopted uh, uh, an innovative model called the Ratnapura model, the name came later, uh, where uh, multiple agencies were uh, expected to coordinate and provide a holistic uh, solution to child labor in their particular district. This, this was successful and eventually it was rolled on to other districts as well. Uh, thirdly, long-term political and financial investment uh, as well as uh, uh, financial commitment, as well as technical commitment, has been crucial. Political commitment, of course, comes from the government and the national stakeholders, and the government has been consistent in this, and the commitment has come from the highest level, vertically, to the lowest level of maybe the frontline workers, from the labor inspectors, from the school teachers, from the uh, social workers, etc. Uh, at the same time, the commitment has been also lateral in the sense that the country has been able to pull together other ministries like education, the ministry in, uh, in charge of child protection, the ministry in charge of vocational training to bring their collective effort towards addressing child labor. So this has been another success, I would say. Tech in terms of technical commitment uh, among other partners, ILO has played a key role in staying together with the government, sometimes a big presence, sometimes a small presence. It doesn't matter. What matters is the consistent presence, uh, together with the government to walk the policy path the, uh, of the government towards success. And this commitment has been backed by the donor commitment as well. Sri Lanka has been lucky to enjoy continuous support from the US uh, Department of Labor, uh, which has been a very uh, 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 vital uh, support line uh, throughout the last two decades. So with this, uh, a sucks, uh, I mean, uh, the country has been able to narrow down the uh, child labor issue to less than 1%. But beyond that, what do you do? How do you reduce? Because beyond, when, the, when the numbers get smaller, it's not feasible to measure those numbers through national surveys and also you, donors or I mean the country it's not uh, feasible to invest large amounts of money on national service so the answer to measure the child measure child labor to monitor child labor is to have a good monitoring system and this is what Sri Lanka is doing right now to see how a, a solid a robust monitoring system can support the uh, proper data gathering and contribute towards the elimination of child labor. Now, this monitoring system, uh, if we were to establish it in a robust and solid manner, it has to be widely known so that the public can participate in it. You know, it has to be owned by the people. And it has to be widely connected because uh, it's not just the Ministry of Labor, but it's also the Ministry of Education, the Ministry in charge of child protection, the Ministry in charge of vocational training. They all have to contribute and link to this system. Right? Uh, because it's not only the monitoring, but also the response part has to, has to also be there in that system. 
then it has to be backed by good social norm, uh, positive social norms towards child labor. It has to be, child labor has to be seen as something that is socially unacceptable so that people, the, the public can report and use the system to, uh, to, to uh, alert the authorities on child labor uh, whenever, whenever it occurs. And it also has to be trusted by people. If not, that is not going to work. So this is the path that Sri Lanka has taken towards success. And this is the path that Sri Lanka is taking uh, towards eliminating child labor totally from Sri Lanka. But of course, uh, <clears throat> the, the final outcome depends on keeping the momentum going. And it is eventually the government and the national electors led by the government who will uh, succeed in eliminating child labor in Sri Lanka. As ILO, our job is to be present and provide the right advice, uh, the right technical support at the right time. And that is what we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have some questions that have come in and I have a few that have been sent to me. Um, so perhaps I could start um, turning back to uh, Claudia and your work. Um, we have a question that's come in about data collection. And um, it's a question about how um, data collection works in the context of um, collecting education data. So the question is, is um, whether we can base education data um, and its updates every year to um, measure child labor versus the number of children who are in school. So um, Claudia, is that something that UNICEF engages with? Thank you very much uh, for this question. The collection of data uh, on child labor needs to be done through household surveys. The reason being, um, there is of course a significant proportion of children who are not in school that are in child labor. But at the same time, there are a lot of children who are actually in school and at the same time, they are engaged in child labor. So, for instance, we cannot therefore assume that being out of school is the equivalent of being engaged in child labor because we have a significant proportion of child laborers who are actually attending school. So household surveys give you the opportunity to really collect information on education, including, for instance, uh, school attendance, but also learning outcomes. And this is how it's been done in the multiple indicator cluster survey. And at the same time, collect information on the type of activities that children spend time in. Uh, of course, economic activity and household chores. And this is the best way we can actually monitor child labor and collect uh, data. Now, it is important, of course, another point that was raised to this question, the fact that um, we need to have this data on a routine basis. So we need to ensure that data collection happens at regular interval. Now, for determining prevalence of child marriage, we do not need data for each year because this is not something that is very quickly expected to change. Uh, so three to five years is an appropriate interval for collecting prevalence data on child labor. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a, a couple of questions that I'll slightly group together. Now, one was directed specifically to Dan, but I think um, looking at a couple of these questions, um, they may be ones that other panelists might wish to respond to. So one is on the problems that Goodweave faces trying to remove children from supply chains and uh, where you're encountering these problems um, or this resistance. But the other is um, somebody who's asking what's been proven most effective to compel businesses to adhere to labor regulations and work to rid their supply chains of child labor. So has that been public pressure, international obligations, commercial incentives, um, any other factors? Um, and I would invite um, anyone who wishes to respond to um, jump in and answer um, that one as well. So, but maybe we could start with Dan. Sure. 
I think in terms of the problems removing children from supply chains, our inspection teams could give the most comprehensive answer on that. But a few of the points that, that I've become aware of, um, I mean, for starters, our inspections are, we, our model specifically requires that we be given access to conduct unannounced inspections because no factory manager is going to say, oh yes, we have child labor. And if, if we schedule a date to a date and a time and we inform them that we're coming in on that date and time and they know there are children working, we're not gonna find those children. Um, another issue that, that can come up is, is age verification. So we may suspect that, that a person working in a factory is a child and there will be a dispute around that. And for that, we have also have policies in place that require um, proof of age to be provided in, a, in the case of a suspected child laborer. And then one other one that, that we've had is often, I mean, are the communities where we work uh, are, are often com comprised of migrant workers. And so those workers are moving from place to place depending on where the work is. And so we may remove a child immediately from a work site, but part of our model, it's, it's very important that we be able to follow up and ensure that they're not returning to supply chains. But if, if that child has, has become untraceable and moved to another place, we're not able, we don't have the resource to, to track everybody down. And does anyone else want to jump in or, or speak about that? Um, and I'm thinking specifically as well around the context of COVID. Um, you're talking about the difficulties of tracking and I know that children are moving around a lot right now um, because their factories are closing or they're being returned, um, but not always with appropriate safeguards. So if anybody else wants to, to jump in and, and answer that, otherwise we could turn to yep, another question. Alice. I just want to, to comment uh, and compliment regarding to the different challenge, challenges faced <clears throat> addressing child labor in the value chain, in the supply chain. And I think that there are many, many challenges. Uh, for example, one is that the different stakeholders in the supply chain accept that there is child labor, that child labor is an issue because most of the cases they deny that there is child labor. So we have to have uh, data, we have to know and the characteristic of child labor in the different supply chains and talk with the different stakeholders so they can accept that there is child labor and also <clears throat> that they come into agreement that is needed to be addressed jointly by the different stakeholders because it's a, as we know, it's a very complex problem and the different stakeholder has to agree on how they are, go they are going to address uh, child labor and in this, um, in, in this specific situation in defining what is the, how we're going to address child labor, it's important to review the roles and responsibilities and differentiate what are the roles and responsibilities of the private sector and what are the roles and responsibilities of the government and how the different actions and programs can, can complement. And based, on, and based on that, start building consensus on how can uh, the private sector implement due diligence or grievance mechanisms through all the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I could ask another question about, um, and going back to the context of Sri Lanka, um, how is Sri Lanka working to sort of withstand the negative impact of the COVID pandemic? I mean, working with a government, there's different opportunities for response. And I'm curious about what additional measures have been taken to address the problem there, um, especially in the context of just getting to that last 1%. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, Little too early to talk about uh, how uh, COVID uh, the pandemic, the pandemic has impacted on child labor in Sri Lanka, because uh, firstly, Sri Lanka uh, contained rather successfully the first wave of the pandemic. And uh, in a couple of months, uh, was able to open schools uh, and also uh, most um, uh, government uh, activity resumed normalcy. Uh, 
and uh, the, the impact of the pandemic was mitigated to an extent. But unfortunately, in the last uh, month, uh, one month, the country is undergoing a second uh, wave and then now uh, there is a new challenge. Uh, so uh, definitely the vulnerability has increased. Vulnerability to child labor has increased. But at the same time, uh, the government also is taking certain social welfare measures like uh, uh, <clears throat> support to families uh, that are uh, uh, poor, uh, who are not able to access their livelihood. So some sort of interim support is being provided by the government uh, through its welfare measures. Uh, the uh, labor monitoring uh, is also continuing with certain uh, constraints, of course, you know, constraints of mobility, et cetera. Uh, the school system is shifting. Uh, many schools are also offering um, online education, particularly the private schools. So uh, <clears throat> they have, the government is trying to sort of uh, balance uh, between lockdowns and providing social welfare measures. Uh, but of course, the vulnerability has increased and uh, the government as well as uh, other actors have to come up with more robust measures to uh, address the negative impacts of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, and this is another question that perhaps anybody may jump in on. Um, but one of the things that we think about is resilience and uh, building back efforts um, in the wake of COVID. And um, I'm wondering if any of you could speak to any of the mitigation measures that you've taken and whether they might change your forward work, whether it's um, in surveys and data collection, um, if possible, or in program implementation, getting around school closures, um, different type of barriers to inspections or other type of um, work that you're doing in your organizations. And I'm thinking as well around, um, oh, Oscar. Yes, Alice thinks. Something that we have found with the pandemic is that in the rural communities, uh, in the case of Mexico, um, the, uh, the public uh, education service continue through television, through TV programs. But in these communities, uh, there is no TV signal. So even though they can have a, a TV, they don't have a, a TV signal unless they are paying a private, um, private services. So what we've, <laughs> I think that is a, an example of resilience is that right now teachers are having every two weeks meetings with parents so they can provide some homeworks and provide some guidance with, with activities that children can develop in at their house, uh, with the other households. And uh, this is a, a good example of resilience because right now that schools are closed, are closed and teachers continue uh, looking for different alternatives so children can continue with receiving the education services. And within the project, what we are doing is uh, providing information uh, to teachers, to parents on the prevention of COVID-19 while they are having these meetings every, every week or every two weeks, and also raising awareness about the importance of education because even though the schools are closed, uh, children has to be enrolled in the, in the schools and they have to be developing and answering the, the questions, the, the homeworks that the teachers are providing. So I think that this is a good example. And also uh, I can talk regarding to the private sector where in the case of the sugarcane sector in Mexico, they, <clears throat> uh, in coordination with the project, we have developed a specific guidelines um, based of international guidelines and also the national guidelines that the government had developed to prevent COVID-19 <clears throat> in the work centers. And we conduct a, a several workshops to analyze the, the context, to analyze the needs of the sectors. And based on that, we developed these guidelines, manuals, and now we're providing training so we can avoid uh, and reduce the risk of having 
infections in during the sugarcane harvest. And so asking a little bit more about um, the data picture, I know, I understand that Sri Lanka is a pathfinder country in the Alliance 8.7. So it is one of the countries that's committed to really scaling up efforts and uh, showing the way. And I'm wondering if um, you know, UNICEF, also an Alliance member and the ILO as they collaborate on these measurements um, are working through pathfinders or using the Sri Lankan example to encourage countries to continue to gather data, to track progress, especially right now when resources are so limited and, and perhaps as, as you've all alluded to, some countries may be inclined to dilute labor laws right now um, in the context of economic recovery. Um, I would, uh, you know, answer one part of the question, which is uh, Sri Lanka's role uh, as Pathfinder country, as well as uh, uh, how uh, Pathfinder countries in general have contributed to um, containing uh, child labor, uh, limiting child labor in the, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, I think um, Sri Lanka is, uh, I mean, uh, is one of the uh, first countries to join as a Pathfinder country. Uh, when, the, when the concept of uh, Pathfinder countries was introduced, you know, back in 2017, I think in 2018, Sri Lanka became a Pathfinder country, a volunteer to uh, uh, become a Pathfinder country. And since then, uh, the country has participated in many learning events and uh, uh, has shared it, its experience as well as taken experience from other countries uh, on addressing child labor, particularly countries that uh, uh, have succeeded in addressing child labor. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, Sri Lanka has to also do uh, certain other things like uh, linking child labor with uh, the measurement of uh, uh, trafficking, human trafficking and forced labor, because when you talk about child labor, it's not just the hazardous labor that we're talking about. We are talking about also uh, other types of uh, worse forms of child labor like uh, uh, child sexual, uh, commercial sexual exploitation, uh, children used in uh, illicit activities, etc. So these uh, areas may be sometimes handled by other ministries or other government agencies. So this is where that link has to be established. Uh, so uh, a, a more collective, a wider platform for different uh, partners to come together, non-conventional partners to come together and address child labor, forced labor, tra trafficking, uh, all those issues that are mentioned under the uh, SDGs 8.7 to be addressed in a more holistic manner. So this is a path that Sri Lanka can take uh, in terms of uh, being a pathfinder country. Uh, pathfinder countries have, uh, I mean, been in the for, uh, forefront, you know, come, come forward to uh, do more. Uh, they have, uh, while a lot of, uh, while many countries have uh, kept aside labor issues and for, uh, promoting more, uh, focusing on more uh, employment and uh, in, uh, employment generation and enterprises, uh, Pathfinder countries, at least in the in the South South Asia region, have kept their focus on child labor without losing the momentum. So that is. One thing that we need to keep, keep, keep the credit, uh, give the credit to those countries. Uh, they have been uh, constantly in touch with other countries, with the uh, Alliance 8.7 Secretariat to share their experience as well as learn from the others. And Alice, if I might come in on this issue about uh, continuing the collection of data. From UNICEF side, uh, UNICEF is supporting uh, the collection of data on child labor through the multiple indicator cluster surveys. For this current round of mixed survey, which, which started, of course, um, in, in 2019, there are 70 countries, low, mostly low and middle income countries, that will be going to the field or have gone already to the field to collect this information. So, of course, there has been suspension of some of the activities in many countries due to COVID, but in, uh, in, in other countries, the activities have continued or resumed 
We are also exploring alternative mode of administration of the questionnaire to ensure continuity of data collection. It is important for me to underscore the fact that these are government-led initiatives. UNICEF provides technical and financial support, but the government ownership is paramount. And it's, it's throughout the entire process of data generation from the design of the questionnaire all the way to the dissemination and use of the data. So there's going to be many countries going to the field uh, over the next few months. And of course, this information will be critical for us to understand whether there, are, there have been changes to the prevalence of, uh, of child marriage that could be linked to, to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we'll be looking forward to featuring that data as it's gathered um, on our Delta 8.7 website. Well, um, we've reached the end of our hour and um, honestly, we could have kept going, um, but I um, want to thank so much um, all of you who have joined us for this discussion and especially a huge thanks to our panelists who have been so generous in sharing their observations and expertise today. My regret that we're not all here in person and can't applaud you um, is, is real, but um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to share these insights um, and continue this work together. So thank you all so much. And wherever you are, I hope you have a good day, a good evening, a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Others as well. Thank you.